Uh, I'm Catherine Knox. I'm a policy and research program manager at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, and I'm really delighted that today we've launched the Climate Just website, which is a new resource to help local authorities and their partners and other organisations working on climate change and organisations working with vulnerable communities to try and support them in their responses to climate change. Um, we've been working with partners at the Environment Agency, the University of Manchester, and Climate UK, and uh, we've had a really interesting meeting today with a number of people in the southwest region to talk about how we can actually use the Climate Just tool. Um, for those people who are interested in finding out more about the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, you can go to our website, www.jrf.org.uk. The JRF got interested in looking at this issue because um, we're concerned about the social justice issues around climate change impacts in the UK, so which people might be most effective in, and particularly concerned about those who face poverty and disadvantage who might be made more vulnerable by climate change. And the organisation is interested in looking at the cause of social problems, trying to support policy and practice change to make a difference. So we've looked at uh, climate change issues in the UK for a number of years. We've been doing research looking at uh, that agenda and now we're trying to do more to support community resilience going forward and we hope the Climate Just website will help with that process. Hi, I'm uh, Daniel Johns. I'm the Head of Adaptation at the Committee on Climate Change. And today I was here at uh, in Bristol, uh, Bristol Aquarium, helping to launch the Climate Just website, which is a new resource from uh, Joseph Roundtree Foundation, Climate UK, the Environment Agency and the University of Manchester, helping to uh, better understand exactly uh, the vulnerabilities to climate change that we have here in the UK. Because climate change over the course of the next few decades uh, will also hit the UK as it will across the whole of the world, but it will play out differently for different people. Uh, even in the UK, where we are relatively wealthy, of course, as a country, and also less exposed than certain parts of the world in the more kind of tropical areas. And in terms of adaptation, we are preparing ourselves for the climate change we can expect. We need to do different things in different places based on who lives there and the kind of climate hazards we can expect. Some parts of the country are more exposed than others to flood risk, and other parts of the country are more exposed to heat stress. Yeah. In this country, we are still building flats uh, in tall, high-rise buildings that are more exposed to, to overheating, even in the cool summer at the moment. And by the 2050s, we can expect you know, summer heat waves like the one we saw in 2003 to happen as often as every other year. So we need to adapt to our built environment. We need to prepare ourselves for the inevitable consequences of climate change. And the Climate Just website gives us the information, gives us the resources we need to understand where the risk is going to be particularly acute and what steps might need to be taken to address it. Hi, I'm Juliet Daniels. I'm Director of Climate UK. And we're just here at the launch event of the Climate just website. Uh, it's gone live today, we're very excited about it. Uh, so Climate UK has produced this website in partnership with the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, um, the University of Manchester and the Environment Agency. And this website is a resource for anyone who wants to go and visit it to find out more about um, who is vulnerable to climate change in England, who is at risk, what you can do to make responses to climate change more fair and more socially just and what practical resources there are available to you uh, to respond to climate change. So we're here in Bristol because it's the European Green Capital 2015. Very pleased to be launching it in partnership with Climate Southwest, um, one of the 12 climate change partnerships that is part of Climate UK. Um, and we will we really hope that you're going to enjoy the site and the web address for the site is www.climatejust.org.uk. My name is Kit England, I am the chair of the Core Cities Climate Resilience and Adaptation Working Group and I'm also a Policy and Communications Officer for Newcastle City Council working on climate change. Um, been here today at the Climate Just event um, helping kind of launch the tool. Um, and really that's because core cities see climate change as a really big risk in terms of the quality of life to our residents in our cities and also because it may exacerbate inequalities that are already existing in cities. Um, in terms of how we're using the tool, um, you know, Newcastle's been sitting on the project advisory group with the JRF for a couple of years looking at this and we're now starting to use those resources that have been produced in terms of helping us develop our understanding of the, the kind of the relative climate disadvantage in the city and then thinking about how do we change our plans, our strategies to accommodate for that. 
Um, the event today has been fantastic. It's been great to be able to talk to people and spur off a lot of ideas. Been a lot of positive enthusiasm, um, and I, you know, hopefully, more people watching this will go to the website and look for themselves about how climate change might impact in their area and what they can do about it. Right. Uh, hello, and welcome, everybody. Can we just call things to order a little bit. Um, we want to make a start. Uh, apologies, first of all, if people had the same issue as I did getting here. Uh, today, a uh, slight lack of trains coming out of London. Um, but I'm very grateful to be here, to be invited to help uh, launch today the Climate Just uh, website. Um, the website was launched formally this morning. And to welcome you here, uh, here today for what hopefully will be a very uh, interesting and useful workshop about understanding exactly how uh, climate change is expected to plan, kind of play out in different parts of the country. And I suppose that's the important part to emphasise here, really, is that uh, you know, climate change will affect different people in different ways. You know, I suppose in terms of the UK, um, we should be grateful that we live in the, you know, the temperate parts of the world, the Northern Hemisphere, and we're a relatively affluent country. So I guess we can't pretend that climate change will have the same uh, scale and, and uh, scale of impact as perhaps other parts of the world that are more heavily uh, populated, that are already severely water stressed and faced, uh, face uh, even bigger extremes than climate change that we can expect. But certainly here within the UK, the maps clearly show on the, the new website that different parts of the country will see different um, impacts, bits to do with fuel poverty, bits to do with flood risk, uh, bits to do with heat stress. Um, and I think this is a really useful and important resource for local authorities to be planning and looking ahead to how climate change will affect our populations. Because again, you know, here in Bristol, as just one example, we can expect uh, not just the impacts of climate change, but we can expect uh, growth in um, the elderly and the vulnerable. You know, thousands of more people are expected to be you know, living in the city over the age of 75 in just the, in the next few years, let alone the next few decades. And uh, you know, we have also within the city, the city startling um, inequality of uh, you know, one in four children apparently born uh, born, in po born into poverty. So we clearly are in a situation where there are already problems to do with inequality in this country. That's uh, only going to get worse with climate change unless it's uh, managed appropriately. And I suppose that's, what's, uh, that's what we're here to do, to understand exactly what the evidence is telling us about the level of inequality and perhaps then start to think about what we might be able to do with it through local adaptation planning, changes to the planning system, uh, thinking about our built environment in terms of the homes uh, that people live in, the hospitals and the care homes that look after people uh, when they're ill and vulnerable, and about uh, the, the way in which we manage water within the built and the natural environment so that we can uh, cope with changes in, uh, in rainfall levels uh, and the amount of water in the natural environment so we can um, make the most of the water when it's available and also a cope when we have too much. Um, I should have said at the outset, I'm Daniel Johns. I, I'm the head of adaptation at the UK's Committee on Climate Change. So my role is to support the work of the Adaptation Subcommittee, which is the government's independent statutory advisor on preparing for climate change. And one of the things that we're working towards is understanding exactly what the national adaptation programme that was published by the government a couple of years ago is achieving at the national level in terms of preparing the country for climate change. But I suppose the underlying message within the NAP is that this is as much a local issue as it is a national issue. That adaptation is not something that you can have a kind of command and control problem and all parts of the country should evolve and adapt in the same way. This has to be owned locally, has to be locally specific, uh, relevant to the context in which you are planning. Um, and therefore, again, climate just as a resource and uh, you as you work for the local authorities, the NGOs or whatever sector you belong in, it's really important for those local plans to come forward and to help uh, adapt us in terms of our economy, our society and the environment to, to face the challenges, challenges we can expect in the future. And just to also note that this event is being filmed. Uh, Bristol is a, is a green capital, as I understand it. Uh, there is money available to film events like this, which are to do with climate change or, or, or the wider environment. And so today's event will be filmed, uh, probably just the opening session and the closing session. 
and uh, an edited down version will be put on YouTube so people can be able to uh, refer to that later. So that's it from me. Um, in terms of the agenda, I'll just run through very quickly what we're going to be doing for the next kind of hour or so before the next chance to drink coffee, which is, first of all, uh, ask Catherine Knox from the JRF to talk about Climate, ju climate Just as, a, as an overall programme. Obviously, the website is only just one part of that. Uh, Kit England, representing the core cities, um, are talking about how to use the climate justice tools, uh, particularly from a local authority perspective. Um, then we'll have a question and answer session, which, which I'll look after. And then finally, Juliet Daniels, assuming she actually manages to get here from London, um, will give you an introduction to the website itself. And then the rest of the day will really be about understanding exactly how the website works and making it hopefully a useful tool for you to take back with you. Um, so that's it for me. Perhaps, uh, Catherine, let's, let's hand over to you. Thanks very much, Daniel, for introducing the day, and thanks to everyone for coming. It's great to see such a good turnout. I'm really pleased that you've made it, and I hope you'll find it an interesting day. So we're here to talk about the new Climate Just website, as Daniel said, launched today, which JRF has been working on with a number of partners, the Environment Agency, the University of Manchester and Climate UK. Um, so we're very grateful for everyone's input to that. So um, I'm going to talk you through uh, some issues around social justice and climate change, uh, share some of our research findings with you, and then talk to you about how climate just could help you in your different roles. So what, what, what is climate justice? I'm just going to do a quick straw poll. Um, how many of you have used this term, come across it? Quite a few, yeah. For, for some, probably a bit of a bit jargony, hard to know what it's about. So we'll talk about that before we talk about the, the research and the website. So what, what is climate justice all about? Well, um, some of you will know that the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, where I work, is concerned about poverty and disadvantage in the UK and looking at the causes of those problems and what we can do about them. And what we're concerned about is that climate change is going to increase poverty, disadvantage and inequality within the UK. And these, this raises a number of issues in terms of social justice. So here are some of the dimensions of interest. Climate, just, climate change is obviously, there's an issue about who is causing carbon emissions, causing the problem, if you like. And there is real inequity in that. And if you follow the international negotiations, you'll know that that's a big sticking point in terms of trying to achieve international agreements about climate uh, change and carbon reduction, uh, with developing world uh, responsible for less emissions than the developed world, what's going to happen in terms of the growth of those countries. So the, these inequities in responsibility for emissions raise questions about who's responsible for action then. Some of us are disproportionately uh, emitting uh, carbon through our actions every day. Um, are we taking more responsibility to do something about it? question there and that that question is not just a question internationally it's a question for nations and within nations there are big issues this is the thing we'll be talking a lot about today but about the inequities we might see in the social impacts of climate change and extreme weather so we can expect that there might be worse impact for more disadvantaged communities and we'll talk about the research we've done on that who are we actually going to protect how are we making the decisions about where resources go and are we thinking about the social context uh, in making those decisions? On the other side there, there are real questions about how the costs and benefits of policy and practice responses are shared. So we want to transition to a low carbon economy and society, <laughs> but who's paying for the, the, the measures that need to be put in place? How is that transition being addressed? And we know if we don't make decisions now that uh, are going to ensure a safe future, that's going to raise questions of intergenerational justice. What happens to our children and future generations in terms of the choices that we make now? And then that gives us questions about procedural justice too. Who has voice in the decisions that are being made about climate change? And that, again, as, as I've said, there are questions internationally on that in terms of the international agreements. It's also an issue within the UK. So some uh, communities have more voice. Uh, so some people participate more in democracy and will have their views represented better. There are questions about people and about places and who's, whose views are being heard in terms of what gets done. 
So why does all this matter? Um, I'm sure most of you uh, already have, have heard these things said, but climate change is expected to be the biggest threat to public health this century. It's what the medical profession are telling us. We know from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that risks are unevenly distributed and are generally greater for disadvantaged people and communities in countries at all levels of development. So, as I said, real questions, moral questions about who we protect, rights, responsibilities and roles in, in action. We know there's massive pressure on public services, which is reducing capacity to, to act, which makes this even more uh, acute an issue. And we need to be thinking about the transition that we make. So what does JRF research tell us? So I'm going to run through four areas where we've uh, commissioned work to tell you a bit about that. Uh, and we have some, some people who are involved in some of that research in the room who you can talk to more. So responsibility for emissions varies substantially by income. There are real inequities in some of the, the social consequences as a result of energy policies that are currently in place in the UK. There are unequal impacts on people's welfare, as I said, from, from extreme weather. And we know that uh, there's a long way to go still in terms of adaptation policy, in terms of addressing issues of social vulnerability. So just to run through those in a bit more detail then, research done for us by the Centre for Sustainable Energy, who are represented here today, has looked at emissions associated with different income groups in the UK. And what we know is that those who are on the highest incomes are responsible for a greater share of carbon emissions. And if we just look at uh, housing and transport emissions, the top income decile is responsible for around 16 tonnes of carbon dioxide per year, compared to only five for those on the lowest income. So that's a big disparity there um, relating to people's income. And while this, this data is based on the emissions associated with household energy use and personal transport, it's so only part of our emissions picture, we know that the same holds true in terms of other things, in terms of consumption. Generally, people on higher incomes are emitting more than people on lower incomes through the things that they buy, the goods and services that they consume. So this just amplifies that and shows some of the, the differences in terms of different parts of the picture. So for house, the average household emissions. And if we look at transport, you can see the disparity is enormous for flights, probably not that surprising, but over 10 times the difference in terms of the emissions responsibility of the uh, highest 10% of earners compared to the lowest 10% of earners. Housing, there's less of a difference. Um, if you think about it, we all need a certain level of warmth to keep, uh, a certain level of energy to keep warm at home. And so there's less disparity there. So policy costs and benefits on domestic energy bills are not equally shared. We know that through um, energy policy, we are um, paying for some of the costs of transition to a low carbon economy through our household energy bills. But at the moment, there are questions about who's paying the share of, of these costs. So everyone pays some proportion of costs, but actually there are differences in terms of how things are working over the interventions that are being made with some of that money. So, for instance, some of the policies that we're paying towards are things like the feed-in tariff. Everyone pays a little bit through their bills towards the implementation of that, but we don't all benefit from that policy. So if you think about it, um, it's people on higher incomes who are more in a position to take up things like the feed-in tariff, and those people will have a massive benefit in terms of the reduction on their energy bills, but those on lower incomes are less able to benefit from this. And there's a lot more to say about this work, which I haven't got time to, to cover today, but CSE uh, are here in the room and could tell you more about that and we can follow up if you're interested. So what creates climate disadvantage? This is a really integral part of the thinking that's informed our website and the mapping part of it for those of you who are interested in that. So I'll spend a bit of time explaining here. So climate disadvantage um, has been characterised as a combination of social vulnerability and exposure to climate hazards. So vulnerability is about the likelihood and degree to which uh, a climate impact will lead to a loss in well-being. So if you think about it, when floods happen, not everyone is equally affected by them. Some people struggle more and are less able to cope. That relates to their social vulnerability. Exposure is about the likelihood and degree to which people are likely to be exposed to extreme weather, of floods, heat waves and other, other hazards. So we're not all um, equally at risk in that sense. 
So if we look at vulnerability, there are a number of components here. Sensitivity in the middle, personal sensitivity, relates to people's individual characteristics that might make them more vulnerable. So we know that, for instance, older people are less able to regulate their body temperatures in a heat wave. That makes them more personally sensitive to heat. If we look at ex enhanced exposure, this factor here, we know that uh, there are issues if you live in a floodplain, but also the nature of the built and natural environment will make a difference and could either offset or enhance or increase your exposure. So if you think about it, if you live in a basement flat, you're going to be more at risk from flooding than someone who's in a high rise flat. Uh, but the opposite may be true for heat. So if you're at the top of a building, that's more problematic for dealing with heat. So the natural and built environment can increase or offset your general exposure. Then there are factors relating to people's adaptive capacity. And by that, we mean people's ability to prepare, respond and recover from extreme events. And so the work that Manchester University has done looking at this issue has basically said it's that vulnerability we need to think about alongside exposure to a hazard. And it's the combination of those things that will lead to climate disadvantage for different communities. So I've, I've said a bit already about some of the factors that we think affect social vulnerability. Personal factors around age, health status, environmental factors about the characteristics of, of the built and natural environment. We'll say a bit more about the social factors there. So I think this is the area we think about least at the moment. We tend to think a bit about <coughs> age and health and we tend to think a bit about the built environment. We're not thinking enough about some of the social factors that matter in people's ability to cope with extreme weather and climate change. So low income is an important issue and we know that people on low incomes are less able to take up flood insurance, there's less take up of flood insurance, so not only um, are they less able to cope when a flood hits with the resources that they've got, they have no safety net in place to help them. Tenure is also important, so people in private rented housing or social housing are less able to modify their environments, they're relying on their landlords to help them. Um, there'll be differences in terms of social landlords and private landlords in terms of their willingness and um, interest in taking action to actually deal with if things like property level protection measures for flooding and so on. Social isolation is also really important. We know that some of the people who died in the heat waves in 2003 were people who were socially isolated uh, and those, those issues make a big difference in terms of people's ability to deal with extreme weather. So what I wanted to show you is the work that uh, the University of Manchester did for us at JRF to try and look at all the data sets linked to those factors that I've just mentioned. And Manchester created an index of social vulnerability, looking at all those factors, the data sets that we could extract, and then creating a, a vulnerability index. So that's what that picture on the top left is about. It's about the places that are vulnerable to flooding. And the vulnerability, the areas that are red are the areas that are most concerned in that map. If we then look at how that relates to flood exposure based on environment agency data, we can see where high, high social vulnerability coincides with high exposure. And that's where the areas are red in the bottom map. So those areas at the bottom that are red, we describe as flood disadvantaged. And these um, areas are where, as I say, vulnerability and exposure coincide. And what we have is that the most flood disadvantaged region is, is Yorkshire and the Humber, but there are places all around the country where there are pockets of very acute problems potentially. And we also know from the work that Manchester did that the picture in 2011 is quite similar to the picture that emerged in 2001 when we first looked into this. So this mapping has been updated using 2011 census data and there's not really a, a much change. The same approach has been taken to look at surface water flooding. So the surface water flood exposure data looks quite different. That's based on environment agency information. Some of it's national model modelling and some of it's local modelling, so it's a bit more complicated. But then if we look at the overlay, we've got different places that come out as most disadvantaged. But there are an important percentage of, of neighbourhoods that are going to be affected there. And if you want to, to look at this a bit more, uh, you might want to think, well, what are the factors causing social vulnerability in different places? And those factors may differ. So if we look at, this is the overall picture of social vulnerability I showed you initially. 
that's comprised of a number of different parts. So the personal sensitivity factors, enhanced exposure, inability to prepare, respond, recover. And so, for instance, a number of the areas that score badly on sensitivity are coastal areas, and that relates often to the fact that we've got a lot of older people living along the coastline. Some of the areas that score worse on here are areas with a lot of um, built-up areas and, and basement dwellings. And some of the other areas, for instance, on the inability to prepare are areas where we think there might be possible insurance access problems. So the idea is, through the work that you'll see in the mapping tool for the website, you can drill down and have a look at what the factors might be in your area. So we've done, we've done a little bit of work on adaptation policy, looking at uh, the injustice of adaptation responses. So this was a few years ago now. And we found that there was really quite limited evidence of social justice informing what was being done. And it has to be said, there's obviously been a big change in terms of the local setup here in terms of responses because we've lost national mm. indicator sets that were a driver of action and there's been a lot of pressure on local authorities and so on. So the ability of local authorities and partners to respond is very difficult at the moment. We think in general though, but not just locally but also nationally, there, there may be reference to some of the principles or issues of concern, for instance concern about generally vulnerable people, but there's not really enough evidence yet that this is informing practice there's not enough consideration of the joining up of issues around the exposure information we've got and the social context. So these things need to be better looked at together. There's also been a tendency to think about things in a sector-based way rather than looking at the interrelationships between different aspects and thinking about how these play out in a community. So what might happen over the long term around, for instance, if uh, flood insurance premiums raised after the flood ray scheme comes to an end, some areas may become very difficult to get uh, household insurance for. That may lead to social sorting. That may lead to um, problems in terms of neighbourhood blight over time in the long term. Uh, and so, so lots of issues to consider there. We think there needs to be more focus on vulnerable groups and more thinking about long-term issues. And we often talk about the need for social and environmental stakeholders to work together better. So it's, it, there's a lot of people who are obviously very committed to this um, agenda who tend to be in maybe a climate change or sustainability role it's harder to kind of get the reach into maybe some of the social uh, st stakeholders who've got a really important role to play and I'm really pleased that there are some people from public health and other um, roles here today who, who can help us make that link to who are the vulnerable people that we need to protect and what are we going to do to support them we're already doing lots of things for, for other purposes but are we thinking about climate change and clearly um, private sector and economic questions are also important here. So where does Climate Just come in? Uh, the Climate Just website is trying to help people in making decisions and planning responses to climate change at the local level. The information and guidance we put together is, is primarily aimed at local authorities and their partners who work in these kind of roles. So health, social care, housing, planning, um, it should say in there as well. The voluntary and community sector are really important here. Um, and we think we're particularly aiming at those who've got a role to play in responses in a sort of either a statutory sense or an important sort of work they do. So what we've got on the, on the website is a range of information from maps to evidence. So some of the evidence base for some of the assertions around who is vulnerable is based on research we can provide and is in there. Case studies on what, what different areas are already doing to respond. Uh, information on how to use the maps and how to create your own maps, um, which I can say a bit more about. Information to help you make a case for action. So we recognise that there are lots of people, many of you may be uh, in this room in this position, who want to do things in different organisations, who need some, to be armed with evidence and information to help make a case to others who may be more senior or in different roles. So we hope that that will help you. So why, why use Climate Just? Um, as I said, I hope it will provide really useful evidence for you, but specifically to help <coughs> to bring uh, to bridge agendas of, of different groups. So what we're, we're particularly interested in is bridging those agendas with the environmental sector and some of those working with vulnerable groups. How, how can you then use this resource to help you in your discussions locally? And just as a bit of a, a prompt, the National Adaptation Programme actually suggests 
climate justice is a project that will deliver one, on one of its ob objectives in minimising the impacts of climate change on vulnerable groups and supporting resilience. So a bit of a connection point there. So these are things we hope it'll help you do. So increase awareness of some of the key issues on developing socially just responses to climate change. Find evidence on which people and places are vulnerable to different impacts. Understand more about responsibility for emissions and patterns of fuel poverty. Look at your local picture through the mapping tool and connect this to actions. Look at who needs to be involved in responses. We've tried to think about kind of tasks and responsibilities and, and try and provide connections there. Think about the actions you can take and so on. So that's just a quick screenshot of the homepage. I know some of you already had a look and we'll be talking that through in more detail. But before then, um, we thought it'd be useful to ask a local authority to come and tell you what it's like trying to apply some of this. So we've got Kit England. Um, happy to take questions at the end. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Um, it's lovely to be here in Bristol. Um, I can't think of a better place really to be talking about climate justice than in the European Green Capital for 2015. So, fantastic example of some of the work that's already going on here. Um, so, my name's Kit England. I am chair of the Core Cities Group on Climate Resilience and Adaptation. For those of you that don't know, the Core Cities Group is a group of the 10 largest cities uh, outside of London that work together collaboratively on issues about making cities more prosperous, better places to live for everyone. Um, and so climate adaptation is a very, very important part of that. But I also have another hat, which is that in my role as a policy advisor at Newcastle City Council, I have a specific role in uh, advising on climate adaptation too. Oh, well, there we go. Right, so in terms of what I'll be covering, um, I think there's five key areas really. Firstly, why should local authorities be interested in climate justice? What's the rationale for, for picking up this agenda and running with it? How the concept of climate justice and some of the latest IPCC thinking might fit together um, to help you take things forward? A little bit about the, the National Adaptation Framework and the role that it sets out for local action. Um, how climate justice fits with partner and local action on vulnerability, and a little bit about how we're using the data up in Newcastle, just to kind of try and inspire you a little bit and give you some examples about how you might take some of this forward from today. So in terms of why should local authorities be interested in climate justice, there's a few different uh, approaches that you might take to your, uh, to, to kind of taking the lid off this agenda, I think. The first is around morality and ethics in terms of creating a fairer, more equitable society. And I think that that's an aim that most of us would find very difficult to argue with. Um, but I think there's also a recognition in there that local government has a, a substantial effect on local populations in terms of the services that local authorities deliver and the impact that they have on, on that vulnerability, um, building adaptive capacity, etc. Uh, there's also a legal uh, perspective in terms of targets around carbon reduction, um, adaptation and fuel poverty, both nationally and you know whether your local authorities actually signed up to some of the, the voluntary commitments such as the Covenant of Mayors or Mayors Adapt. Um, there's then a sort of a financial and enlightened self-interest argument, which is really that as we start to see some of the impacts of climate change, uh, you know, affecting local communities, there is, it reinforces a dependency on public sector organisations and the state in a way that, that we, we want to avoid, if at all possible. You know, it, um, and finally, there's the ripple effect in terms of being at the centre of a network of lots of different organisations where you can affect distributional and procedural justice. So whether that's through partnership working or through procurement strategies and contracts, there's lots of levers there. Um, to, 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 to drive action and kind of there's a recognition that, that that can help. So in terms of how the concept of climate justice fits with the latest IPCC thinking, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, the fifth report um, of the IPCC talks about the concept of climate resilient pathways. So apologies for this slightly obscure diagram, but the concept is that as we go through and develop as a society, there are lots of different points where big decisions are made, where if you can make a consideration of the, the sort of the social vulnerability aspects, the climate disadvantage aspects, um, 
you'll build a kind of a much more resilient society with a lower risk profile in there. So Climate Just is a fantastic resource to make sure that you can account for social justice at those points when you're making those critical decisions, whether it's deciding to build a new housing estate or thinking about reforming uh, the way a service is delivered. There's, there's evidence across the board to help you there. Um, in terms of how it fits with the National Adaptation of Framework and, and Local Action, um, well, I'm probably teaching a few of you to suck eggs here, but I thought it was worth covering for those that, 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 that aren't familiar. The Climate Change Act 2008 established the National Framework for, for Adaptation, um, which sets out uh, a risk assessment every five years, um, followed by the National Adaptation Programme. Um, in terms of how it fits for local authorities, it really talks about a voluntary approach to local adaptation, so, so adaptation in the context of localism. So if you see, if your local authority, if your organisation see adaptation as important, then you know the, there's a lot of things that you can do to get involved, but it's, it's about making sure that the local areas respond to those priorities that are important to them. And, and Daniel talked about that, you know, in the, fact, in the sense that the impacts will be different, it will be felt differently. The summary that was written for local government outlines three priorities um, to get local authority moving on the agenda. The first is around developing evidence, and Climate Just is a fantastic resource for, for actually underpinning a lot of um, plans, activities, etc. And hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll see that as you get a chance to play with it after the coffee break. Um, there's a priority around embedding the issue of adaptation into policies and plans, so things like joint strategic needs assessments, health and well-being strategies, local flood risk management strategies, thinking about how climate change will change those things over time. And then finally, looking at working in partnership at the local level to drive action. So this might be through local nature partnerships, local enterprise partnerships, or local resilience fora. So climate just can support in all of those activities and more. So in terms of how it can support partner and local action on, on vulnerability, um, Catherine talked about the framework that, that Climate Just uses in terms of sensitivity, adaptive capacity, enhanced exposure. And actually when you start to map that onto the kind of the different organisations um, that have a role to play at a local level and in local authorities more generally, it's quite an interesting picture. So these will be circulated afterwards, so please don't feel like... Um, but you need to write everything down. And also, um, I apologise if I've missed anybody off. Um, this is my own kind of thinking around some of this. So I'm, if your organisation's not on there, I'm sorry. But what it, what it shows you is um, a list of all the different partners that um, have a role to play in terms of building climate resilience or reducing climate disadvantage at a local level um, and how that relates to enhanced exposure, sensitivity, adaptive capacity. So things like electricity distribution companies that have a role around enhanced exposure in terms of making sure that the electricity network and infrastructure is resilient and is not going to be out. But in terms of adaptive capacity, they also have registers around those who are electricity dependent so that actually, should there be interruptions in supplies, responses can be prioritised. Similarly, with landlords, they have a role around enhanced exposure because there's a 10-year issue there, as Catherine touched on, where a lot of people in rented accommodation can't make modifications to their properties. So hopefully that's just a couple of illustrations um, about some of the ways and some of the actors that you might need to engage in developing some of those approaches that help you drive, drive change. And the same with local authority services. Um, again, a bit of a brain dump about all the different services and the potential levers there for, for acting on the framework. So uh, they may be named slightly different in your local area, but um, you know some generic things there around flood management or economic development, development management, community resilience. I've had a few conversations going on in the room about some of those issues as well. Um, so in terms of how we've used the data, how we're using the data, um, I thought it would be useful to kind of give you a little quick case study on, on Newcastle, a bit of background about the city, um, have a quick look at its climate disadvantage, and then talk about how we're trying to leverage some of the resources from, from climate just to, to make the city more resilient. So for those of you that don't know Newcastle, it's a city of about 280,000 people uh, up in the northeast of England. Um, and over the last few years, climate change has really risen uh, up the agenda. Um, Mitigation's been there for a while, but in terms of adaptation, looking at, um, looking at how do we prepare, and that's really because I think there's been a recognition around how climate change presents quite a big strategic risk in terms of tackling inequality and, and to quality of life, really. 
Um, in 2010, we sort of started with our strategic approach around uh, a citywide climate change strategy, gathering the evidence around how we've already been ex uh, affected by extreme weather. Um, but then in 2012, uh, we were hit by a 1 in 125 year rainfall cloudburst event. 50 millimetres of rain fell in an hour and the entire city went to pieces. So the transport infrastructure, the metro system went down, there was 8.2 million pounds worth of damage to our highways. But more importantly, 1,200 properties were flooded out and 500 of those were internal. So for those people, it had a significant impact on their lives and the, the narrative, the local narrative changed quite substantially. So where we had been taking a very strategic top-down approach to all of this, um, we suddenly found ourselves in the midst of uh, calls from residents for a city review, looking at the way that the city responded um, and identifying kind of further ways forward for improvement. So in 2013, we did a city review, but at the same time, the National Adaptation Programme was coming together. Um, so we agreed, uh, along with all of the other core cities, including Bristol, um, to try and accelerate our work on, on adaptation. And in 2014, we've got our sort of council and city work programme that we're taking forward. I won't say everything's perfect, but we're, we, you know, we're, we're pleased that we're, we're moving forward with that. So in terms of how climate disadvantage looks in Newcastle, um, I thought it would be worth showing you the flooding picture um, rather than the heat picture, um, just to, to fit in with the narrative, really. Um, so Newcastle is a city that's not really at significant risk of flooding. Our biggest risk is from surface water flooding, so in terms of water coming out of the drainage systems, not being able to cope with the capacity of rain, you know, the amount of rainfall falling. Um, but it's quite sporadic. And what this shows you really, um, the, the, the two bars, so this is the city, the two bars, the red bar is the socio-spatial vulnerability to flooding that Catherine talked about. And the blue bar is, your, is our hazard exposure. So just for sort of point of reference, the middle is the natural average, like that. And if you're above the line, then you've got a higher risk. If you're below the line, you've got a lower, lower than natural average kind of on the rankings, I suppose. So what you see from there is a picture where the, the east of the city and parts of the city centre uh, have a relatively high level of surface water disadvantage. When you start to dig into that picture a little bit, you start to see, oh, this is the older slide pack. Um, but um, the actual risks, uh, these should have been updated, I apologize for that. The risks um, in here, actually, we've got a very, very low exposure. Um, I can show anybody if you want to have a chat afterwards. But actually, when you start to dig into the socio-spatial vulnerability, the, patch, the picture looks very, very different. And you start to see some very, very high um, rankings on each of the different domains of social vulnerability. So these little graphs here, the lines going up, are your sensitivity, enhanced exposure, and that adaptive capacity, being able to prepare, respond, and recover. So you'll sort of see in places like Westgate, actually we've got very, very high enhanced exposure, very, very high uh, problems with adaptive capacity, whereas other parts of the city, we've got very, very high sensitivity being a driver there. And that's really interesting and it means that you start to, you can dig into all the different indicators that contribute to this, ag this aggregate so you can start to understand what the drivers are and for us some of it is, is population in there. Um, so in terms of how we're using Climate Just and some of that evidence and that data, um, in 2014 it was a really big part of getting agreement from our politicians on signing up to Mayors Adapt, the European Commission scheme on preparing for the impacts of climate change. So the rationale that, that extreme weather and climate change is widening inequality, um, and if we don't get a grip on it, it will contribute to that overall growing problem of inequality in Newcastle, was really key in, in, in our politicians buying into trying to actually move forward with this agenda. And from there, we've used it to inform our joint strategic needs assessment. That's been given a wider role in Newcastle. It's called No Newcastle, um, and is used to inform all of the local authority service planning. So every service that produces a plan has to refer to that information. It's also going into our flood risk management strategy, and this is this is kind of controversial and a, a bit a bit risky in you know, in some respects. In that, for the first time, we're not just looking at managing flood risk from the perspective of exposure. We're now starting to think of those questions of who is going to be affected by this, and actually, what is the right what is the right type of investment to make given those consequences. Um, not an easy set of discussions, I can tell you, but um, but but an interesting ones and probably the right ones. 
We've been looking at community resilience and kind of enhancing our understanding from our emergency planning teams about what are the different factors, what are the issues that people are likely to encourage on the ground, uh, encounter on the ground. I would say on that um, that the data is probably at a strategic level rather than the operational, and we sort of had some feedback that there are other issues to consider when you get out on the ground, but it's a very, very good start of the 10. A bit of work on validating evidence. So we've already got a heat vulnerability assessment that was done for the city by, by Newcastle University, and we're also running a PhD on socially just adaptation. So looking at the relationship between those and helping consolidate the evidence. And then there's lots of different exciting ideas on future plans. So things like, can we use the data to help us think about where we might get community adoption of resilience measures? Are there communities in the city that might be adopting sustainable urban drainage systems or willing to do that? Can it help us access funding? So European funding streams are coming online to help us with adaptation, ERDF, Life Plus, Horizon. Can we, can we look at some of that? Um, a bit of thinking about our local plan and new developments and actually challenging back about, have you thought about the implications of the development that you're putting in and what it will mean for your area? There's also the opportunity around public health moving into the local authority and thinking about the relationship with the social determinants of health. And then the integration of adaptation and mitigation and a bit of training and capacity building for staff as well. So quite a big list there, um, but, um, but, but all positive. Um, I'll also touch on some of the resources around fuel poverty and mitigation. It's less my area, but really we're starting to think about informing policy and projects to address those facts that Catherine talked about. So about how low-income households pay the most for energy, contribute least to emissions, and benefit least from the policies. Um, so a lot of the resources there are informing things like fuel poverty strategies, uh, the work we're doing around energy service companies and tariffs and district heating, the work around Green Deal providers and the energy company obligation and energy advice. And we're also looking at kind of where those synergies are with adaptation, so are there particular tenures where you know, we can address fuel poverty and extreme cold weather and you know, those kind of ideas. Um, so hopefully, it's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour about why local authorities and other local organisations should be thinking about some of this. Um, I hope it's been interesting, exciting, informative, um, but I'll be around this afternoon, so please feel free to ask any questions now or grab me later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kit Thanks. and Catherine, uh, before him. You might have noticed me fiddling with my smartphone. I'm not being rude. Uh, we're tweeting the event, and I should have mentioned at the outset that uh, we're using the hashtag climate, hashtag climate just. So if you want to participate in that, uh, obviously feel free and get the discussion going, and let's try and promote this event and the Climate Just website as much as we possibly can. Um, we've got about uh, 10 minutes, I suppose, for questions at this stage. I'll probably drag Catherine and Kit back up uh, to answer those, given that they know far more about this stuff than I do. But just want to reflect on the messages of this in comparison with what um, the Adaptation Subcommittee said in our report just in July. You know, there's a lot of emphasis on flood risk, quite rightly. But the other thing that we can expect more and more, uh, more, and more to happen in, in future decades is obviously heat stress in the built environment in particular. Um, the kind of imperceptibly, um, the number of hot days per year has been creeping up over the last few decades. Well, obviously, we look outside and it's cold and we think, oh, what, you know, is climate change really happening? But all the evidence suggests that climate change is real, it's happening. And even here in the UK, we've seen a notable increase in the number of hot days over the course of several decades. And we're not talking about hot days, which could be 30, 35 degrees like we had back in 2003. But the impacts of heat stress start to occur as soon as you get to above the kind of early 20 degrees centigrade centigrade about 22 23 because at that point some of our hospitals for example you'll see internal temperatures achieve, achieving in excess of 30 degrees it becomes more difficult to sleep as soon as you get above 26 degrees and one of the things i learned in compiling last summer's report is actually one of the reasons why the elderly are particularly vulnerable to heat stress is because you lose the ability to sweat as you age and therefore you know your internal body body temperature is just there is no uh, easy means for the elderly to keep themselves cool. They may be in, uh, immobile, so therefore they can't move to, to cooler areas. They may be in uh, overheating hospitals and care homes. And as I say, physiologically, they, they, they find it difficult to keep cool. Um, so it's important just to stress also that we kind of assume that what we're trying to deal with here is a legacy problem, poor decisions that have been made in the past. But actually, when you look, we are still building 
homes that are not fit for the future climates. We're building it based on building regulations that were designed with the past climate in mind, not with the kind of heat waves that we expect in the coming decades. We're building more flats than ever before. So flats in high-rise buildings are particularly prone to overheating. So even in a relatively cool summer, about 20% of our building stock is, is prone to overheating. So with that in mind, uh, perhaps dwelling back, first of all, on the uh, really informative presentation from Catherine about the data and the resources available within the Climate Just website and the, kind of the topic overall, and then trying to make that locally specific about the kinds of things you can be thinking about and doing locally to, to address some of these issues, obviously with KIT. So... Um, just for the sake of the filming, if people could be very uh, clear and loud in asking questions uh, and obviously make sure you let us know who you are and uh, what organisations you represent. Who wants to kick us off? There's a question over here. Yeah. Hi, my name's Nick Bonner from Public Health England. It's a question to Kit. The, the work you've done so far in Newcastle, which um, council departments have taken the lead in coordinating all of that? Um, well, I think it's probably fair to say that it's been the policy team that's been driving a lot of this. So, again, we've done a little bit of work with the AFC and the reports are very, very helpful. Um, and it was enough of a, of a kind of a risk for us, really, to sort of say, well, we don't really know enough about this. We need to understand a lot more and then start to have those discussions with services. So, I mean, Daniel talked about heating. One of the biggest problems we have, actually, um, but it's all anecdotal, is around the PFI programme that we had on building schools. Mm -hmm. So we have a number of schools in the city where actually on a very hot day they're south facing and so um, and glazed and it's Ramadan and we can't give the children water so we shut the schools and everyone goes home. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a cumulative effect of social and environmental factors there that, that, that exacerbate that problem. But we didn't know enough about it. So we kind of recognise it's probably a risk, we need to start exploring it more, and then from there it grew out from a, from a kind of, um, from the centre of the organisation. But I've seen it, I mean similarly, it, it works differently in different places, different organisations will find niches, some places have sustainability teams, that, that, that that's where it starts, or you know, teams of flood management, or those kind of issues. So I, I wouldn't say there's a one-size-fits-all approach, I think that's just how it worked for us. Okay. Has anybody got any experience of doing this in their local area, perhaps with lessons to share? Um, yeah? Just a next one, just from ACOM. We um, produced some talks at Risley for a tent and council, which is about how sustainability and that. It doesn't provide the mapping that you've got, but it gives some case studies of the university, actually, um, the, the team, um, the public health team here. Um, but it... Um, it provides the names of individual planners within the different district councils, and I wondered, um, well, that might be an opportunity for them to kind of link together mm -hmm. so that the two tools can be complementary. Um, that one's obviously at the moment focused on Kent, but it's mm -hmm. got general mm -hmm. advice mm -hmm. that's relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, certainly uh, from our point of view, this is our first go at the tool, and we're looking to develop it over time. So it'll be really interested to, to hear about other things that are going on that we should think about. So, be very happy to follow up and one of the things we'll be asking later on is are there things that uh, you were expecting to see on the website that you haven't seen and would like some information on um, or how can we develop our knowledge about local practice to increase the case studies that we can share with others as well so um, we're looking for exactly this kind of connection thank you okay the question at the back uh, tom Dougal from station Door council was a one-time resident of newcastle <laughs> What I'm sure there are many differences since I was last here, but what, what differences would the average council tax here notice after the activities that you engage I think it's, we focused on take on really around the point that I made about embedding plans and strategies and climate adaptation within there. But I think the other point um, that you would probably notice is a change in the communication strategy. So actually, one of the, the learning points that came out of the city review was about the need, well, the way in which local authorities seem to be given the kind of the responsibility. There was a survey from Cardiff um, University a couple of weeks ago that was published that said, you know, about 70, 70, 80 percent of people think that local, that the government has a responsibility to deal with flooding and the climate change. Well, that's right, 
and I broadly agree with that, but I think there's a, there's, a, there's a message about roles and responsibilities, and actually everybody has a role in managing flood risk, everyone has a role in, to play in managing heat risk, and I think the, the, the kind of, that's the real message that's changed, so I think you, you see things like we're doing a project in, in the west of the city, um, with about 300 to 400 residents with the water company um, talking to people about how their properties collectively contribute to a risk to the city centre through an overland flow that runs in the city and so we're giving water baths, we're doing water efficiency uh, installations and we're also, you know, we're talking to them about you know, what roles their driveways play so there's a kind of, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of that messaging and the communications is the same we're talking about the kind of, the, the big schemes that we're doing so in terms of um, flood risk management schemes and protection of properties but we're sort of saying, well actually, come on, you've got a role to play here's some of those, here's some of the things that you can do and trying to empower communities to take more responsibility one of the things I'd be keen to explore during the course of the afternoon is how this might feed through into the planning system because yeah, I, I think we would recognise that the planning system at the moment isn't working, um, that the local plans where they do exist aren't necessarily kind of legally safe, they're being challenged by developers and increasingly developers seem to be winning. Um, whereas this evidence is very clear that certain areas really aren't appropriate for certain types of uses, for things like um, whether you're building in additional requirements in terms of keeping buildings cool with passive cooling, looking at uh, paving over nat nat uh, natural surfaces and suds. So um, one of the things I, I personally would be interested to see is, do, does this kind of tool give you the evidence you need to make the case for additional policies and local plans? Uh, because I'd say at the moment, the planning system isn't really, in our, in our view, um, leading to the kinds of changes in the built environment that we would like to see to avoid more and more people being at risk of flooding, more and more people being at risk of, of heat stress. Do we have maybe one last question before we move on? Yes, at the front here. That's uh, one for you, Kit. Um, in terms of the slide that you presented, which had the sort of mashup between uh, flood risk at the neighbourhood level and then you showed enhanced exposure and sensitivity on the same page, that was a really compelling um, one visual uh, tool which could be perhaps used to uh, to show people or, or at, uh, at senior levels to influence them on, this, um, on the messages behind this particular tool and what you can do. Did you, uh, was that output from the JRF tool itself or did you download it onto your local GIS system and then produce it from there? Um, it's download. Um, to, you can download all of the data from there to do, uh, from the website to, down, to do your own more in-depth analysis if you want to um, and that's what we did. We, we worked through that. Just to, um, there was a bit of work done with Wigan mm -hmm. the, the, and to kind of provide a bit of a, of a best practice, I suppose, on how to do that, and we, we did the same thing. Okay, uh, run out of time just for now, but obviously more, more chances later to, uh, to talk about this in more detail. Juliet, you made it uh, up from London. Um, so Juliet's from Climate UK, is one of the key partners in the Climate, Je uh, Climate Just project, and in particular this um, website. So Juliet's going to come and talk to us about the website in more detail. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. And yes, hello, here in the nick of time. Um, so I'm Juliet Daniels. I'm uh, one of the directors of Climate UK. Very pleased to be launching the Climate Just website today uh, with this event. I'm just going to take you through uh, a few slides to explain what the content is on the website, and then we're going to have a short video to take you through in more detail um, an explanation of some of the map layers and how they can be used to understand different aspects of vulnerability. Um, so the Climate Just Web tool, uh, it, it encompasses a range of things actually. It looks at um, vulnerability to extreme weather, also fuel poverty and inequalities, um, and it, it presents these in a way that's visual through the mapping, but also there's a vast range of uh, written resources and online tools that you can access through the website. And you can just see the formula there that Catherine's already taken us through. So exposure to climate hazard plus social vulnerability. Um, and you come up with climate disadvantage. Um, so here's the, the start of the map tool here. I'm not going to talk about it much because we're going to have the very whizzy video afterwards where you can uh, see how to use it. This is the front page of the website. Um, and you can see there's a leading question at the top there. Why are some people more vulnerable to climate change? than others and where are they and what can be done to help them. Um, so you can drill down into the questions at the bottom which unpick certain aspects of this around who is vulnerable, which places are disadvantaged and each one you click on will um, give you more information um, 
you can drill down on. So here's one of the questions on who is vulnerable. You can see you've got a very short summary over in the corner, and then you've got much more detail on different types of vulnerable groups that you can click into um, and find out more and find out where you can um, access support and resources if that's your area of work. Um, so who needs to do what? This is another question. Um, it's actually one that we added as a, res as a result of feedback from um, users as we were developing the site uh, who said that they'd like a bit more direction about how to complete specific tasks using the tool and um, how it relates to their own job roles. Um, so that's what we've done here. There's a couple of uh, diagrams which you can click out from the boxes at the bottom. Um, so this is who needs to do what. And just breaks down, depending on what kind of role you have, what kind of department you might be in within your organisation, um, what types of resource would be most helpful for you. And then there's some cross-cutting things that are helpful regardless of what your work area is. Um, there's also some task-based guidance as well, which um, can direct... You know, if you're completing a joint strategic needs assessment as part of your public health role, or if you're looking at a green infrastructure plan, um, there's directed areas of the website that you're able to click into as a result of that. And that's just to try and make things a little bit easier. And there's a whole host of resources that you can find on the website which link out to external tools uh, and resources that other organisations have created so that we hope this can be a portal for you to access other useful information as well as containing it within the site. Um, so you can search, you can see at the top there's a, a type that you can filter and you can apply by sector or type of information um, what kind of resources you'd like. We also have a library of case studies and we're really looking to build on these. So do get in touch if you know of an interesting project or if you um, have heard of something on the grapevine that's going to be happening that you think would be useful for this site. But we already have quite a range um, of case studies on the site, which you can filter down by category or by local area. And you can see here there's actually three layers of information that you can look at for the case studies. So there's a very brief overview to see if you're interested. And there's some more detail available on the site. And then you can actually download um, a much more detailed case study, which will have a contact um, person which you can get in contact with to find out more about the project. So we also have a lot of frequently asked questions on the site, but we'd be interested in your views about whether... Um, there are others that we ought to be addressing. So we're collecting feedback from you today about what would be useful to contain in the site. And there's also a glossary. As Catherine mentioned earlier, some of the terms can seem a bit jargonistic. Um, so we have uh, very detailed descriptions of all of the different technical terms used as part of climate justice, um, which you can go and look up alphabetically or you can actually link through to in the text. And that's like eight actually, so we're just going to hopefully get the video started. The UK is increasingly under threat from the impacts of climate change. We can expect more frequent extreme weather, like flooding and heat waves, which may mean an increase in the costs of living, including food and household energy bills. Disadvantaged communities are likely to be the worst affected. Whether you work in housing, public health, social care, planning or the environment, the Climate Just website gives you a wealth of free resources to understand who is most vulnerable to the consequences of climate change and how you can respond. For the first time, this website brings together maps showing the most vulnerable communities with maps of the areas that face the biggest threats from flooding and extreme temperatures. By doing this, we've created a new way of mapping climate disadvantage for flooding and heat. You can use the Climate Just map tool to look at the picture in your area. We've mapped climate disadvantage down to neighbourhood level across England, so you can see the extent of the issues in your locality. Let's look at an example. Use the drop-down menu in the map tool to access the disadvantage map for river and coastal flooding by ticking the box against this heading. As the key explains, the most acute problems are in the dark red areas. For example, parts of the Yorkshire and Humber region, particularly along the coast. But the data really comes in useful when we use the Climate Just tool to try and work out what's causing the disadvantage. Unticking the flood disadvantage map, 
and instead choosing the flood exposure map, you can see the extent of exposure to actual river and coastal flooding in the area. Now use the menu to look at the area's socio-spatial vulnerability for flooding. It will show which places have the most vulnerable communities. The website can help you examine the differences in particular areas. Let's drill down into some of the indicators to explore more. Sensitivity covers factors like the age and health of the local population. Enhanced exposure highlights which areas of the physical environment will accentuate or offset the severity of flooding or heat, such as the extent of green space in the area or the nature of the built environment. The ability to prepare for, respond to and recover from extreme weather are also highlighted to help identify the importance of wider social issues that might need addressing. Take the area to the northeast of Doncaster, which, according to the overall index, faces acute river flood disadvantage. Part of the area is very exposed to flooding, but it's not particularly built up, so the enhanced exposure indicators don't suggest it faces a problem from this. However, looking at the vulnerability of the people, shows a lot of the population are in poor health, so are likely to be more sensitive to climate impacts. The area's ability to prepare, respond, and recover is worrying. What's causing this? One issue may be problems with insurance availability and affordability, as the maps suggest. Supporting insurance take-up may be important in this area. The best way to learn about Climate Just is to try it yourself. You can look at the national picture of climate disadvantage, or you can go straight in to look at the issues in a particular neighbourhood. Or you may be interested in a group that could be vulnerable, like older people and their likely exposure to heat or flooding. You can also look at which areas suffer from fuel poverty. The Climate Just website offers plenty of tools and resources to help you either initiate change yourself or to make the case for action with others to support vulnerable communities. We've got case studies to show work that's already been done, like the Flood Warden Scheme in Doncaster. Alongside this are suggestions for the steps you could take to develop responses, including ideas about how to support community engagement and raise awareness. Climate Just is all about helping to address climate disadvantage wherever in England you happen to be. We hope using our map tool will be the first step in helping you work out how to do it.